Hey, Brent, how we doing, mate? How's life treating you? I'm very well, Steve. Good to see you. Good stuff, mate. Good stuff. How's things in the uh, centre of the universe, as you call it, where everybody else calls it Leeds? Leeds. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. It's a bit cold at the moment. It's, um, it's manic as well because, you know, we've got the two little ones and they're keeping us both busy, Carly and I. But in general, it's, it's very good. It's good fun at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff, mate. Good stuff. So, like I say, I know we've been chatting off air just after the back of our, like, sort of a bit of mentoring for myself and stuff and that, my business and stuff. But I thought, while I've got you, I'll pick your brains because you're somebody who's helped me massively over the years when it comes to training and coaching and stuff. But one of the big things that's always like jumped out to me whenever I've chatted with you is actually getting the most out of the athlete or getting the most out of the program when it comes to kind of like work capacity, because obviously your background is being one minute you're working with disability athletes and then next thing you're working with golfers and then next thing you've got UFC fighters walking in the ring just about to kick yeah. 10 tons out of each other do you know so it's kind of just wanted to get your thoughts on that that whole work capacity thing and how do you sort of simplify it down in in every time you approach a new sport really you know yeah 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 it's, it's um it's definitely something that's that's a priority for me when I when I first begin working with somebody and real simply, the, the way I, I first sort of started to see this and, and it became a priority was people just aren't fit enough to get strong, to perform mm -hmm. well. And so what I mean by that is that they potentially, let, let's say we do a five set of five squats, they'd need five, six minutes to recover to do something at a similar level. Mm -hmm. And I just started to question what what is the value of the session here like if we're doing a 60 minute session we're, we're only getting in you know 10 sets of work which might be absolutely fine if you're an elite level strength athlete but for 90 percent of human beings including athletes that is not the case mm. for 98 percent so the goal for me was was real simple was to raise fitness yeah and by that, I mean the, the, your ability to work for a 60-minute session and pack more overtime into that session, both from a volume and intensity basis. Yeah. So that, that's my, my first objective, really, with people. It's not, to, it's not to build strength. It's not to build power. It's to build work capacity or, or general fitness in a strength and conditioning manner. Mm. And so when, what, what you find is, and when, and when you do that, is that you don't need five minutes to recover, number one. Um, you get a lot more quality out of the session. You, you're, the people are more coachable because they're, they're able to, to actually listen and hear what you're saying and, and respond to that rather than just being literally recovering. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then in terms of the, the diversity of, and the breadth of the work that you can do is far, far greater. So you, you can get so much more out of the time that you've got with your athletes. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's a real simple way that I approach it. And it, it all came, everything comes from a, a pain point, really a problem that I had, which was actually, I need to do so much more work with you. I only see you two or three times a week and we're not getting enough done in these sessions because you're just not fit enough. Mm to get to, to train properly okay. so everybody talks about you got to get uh let, let's take running right you got to get fit to run and not not run to get fit we, we all we all hear that cliche it's true but there's another level you've got to get fit to get fit to run yeah yeah you know no, and so in our case it's the fitness underneath the strength and conditioning that's underneath the pro the actual sport itself yeah that's a really important piece of the puzzle for me so and, and so when you're looking at that that fitness because most people as soon as you say that probably conjure up these images of 20 minutes on a rowing machine and 30 minutes on a treadmill and stuff so obviously work capacity is always we're looking at well what's the end goal for us guys kettlebell lifters and stuff it's either 10 minutes half marathons or whatever the guys are doing 
what's the key components for you when we're talking about fitness? Obviously, yes, it's the ability to recover, but what, what else makes up those pieces of the puzzle for you when you're approaching it from that performance standpoint? You know? Yeah, yeah. So when, <laughs> when you design your programs, and obviously you, you're well aware of this, and, and I'm sure your listeners are too, the, one of the things that, that is really important is what, once, you, once you know what the athlete looks like and how they move, and you know that the activity, what the activity is that they're training for, you you end up you get your piece of paper out and you make a short list and you say right in an ideal world I want to do this 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 and this okay and then you probably take out some of them and say these this slice down the middle are the these are the critical things that have to be done these are the non-negotiables and within those key things there. There's, there's going to be commonalities in the shapes that you're asking your athletes and clients to make. And I can guarantee that those shapes will evolve, involve squatting movements, hinging movements, lunging, pressing movements, pulling movements. And they're the things that you need to have a proficiency in and be able to recover from and build your work capacity in. So whilst running and rowing may well be underpinning fitness and, and so on and so forth work capacity for me involves building a technical competence to execute those movements over and over and over mm. so I, I i would i'd normally differentiate between general work capacity and technical work capacity not yeah. specific but technical work capacity and so doing real simple stuff like unloaded or, or very light say overhead squats and lunges into some planks and press up type holds into some uh, uh, maybe a bit of sled work and just keep the, the focus is on keeping the technical quality high. No, it's not, it's not metabolic and we're not sprinting. We're not trying to do as much as we can and as fast as we can. We're just trying to keep the quality of the work really high mm. and build that technical work capacity. And then the second side of it is that general work capacity. If somebody is just really, really unfit, yeah, they can't, they can't run a two point four k run, and or, or that would they just can't even get through that. I think there's non negotiables that you think you just need, you just need to get some fitness now. Yeah, well, everybody says well, strength and endurance are conflicting, and yes, they are but only at a higher level, only further up the chain. Mm -hmm. If you are not fit enough to just run for 15 minutes at a decent pace, you're not fit enough. Yeah. You're not fit enough to train. Yeah. So combining all of those components from, say, the technical unloaded basic stuff through to uh, 15 minutes on the, on the treadmill or out on the road running with, with half-decent posture, and a bit of rowing in there that those things will will be that baseline of work capacity development and then over time you know the unloaded bars become lightly loaded bars the lightly loaded bars become medium loaded bars and you raise your work capacity so that is one of the key components of work capacity is can you recover from that session yeah so yeah anybody can make someone tired anybody can grind someone to the ground and and do rep after rep but can they come back the next day and the day after that and repeat that work or similar? And so when you build your work capacity, you find that you can. You're not getting sore anymore from 30K overhead squats and uh, a 15-minute run. It mm. actually now, that part, now that density of that can go into a 10-minute warm-up and you can do that stuff in the warm-up. And now what was training for you is now warm-up. Yeah. So it's all a dynamic animal, a dynamic beast that evolves and work capacity is the underpinning quality, but you're watching people adapt to the work and then making work into warm up and you know, the actual work is now a new level. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm totally makes sense. I think it's something that um we try and do similar to myself, like segmenting that down and get a lot of guys just doing green zone type work do you know in terms of the heart rate separate yeah. there's a lot of benefits from that but that's building that just general fitness being able to yeah. move but also being mindful of actually 
it's one continual pitch it's not you don't progress from one session to the next kind of thing it's such a it's a collective do you know because yeah. you can never really pinpoint the one moment where the body goes right i'm fitter now it's kind of mm. you feel it a little bit but you never know exactly what it is but is it was that last week's workout or was that workout yeah. months ago kind of thing do you know so yeah. but no, it's, it's really interesting i mean i still remember the the tempo type sessions and the warm-ups you used to put me yeah. through stuff in terms yeah. of like steve that that bar doesn't stop you you, mm. you, don't, you don't stop you, it's for a minute you've just got to keep that bar moving for a minute yeah. 10 reps and then that's it you know um yeah. And I think that's massive, you know, in terms of being able to hold those key positions and those postures and stuff as well. So definitely, yeah, the, the tempo works good. Um, tempo running, if you, you know, talk about work capacity from an endurance perspective. Tempo mm -hmm. running is great because you, you you're having a bit of recovery. You're not sprinting. You actually can think about technique. You can coach somebody in that. Yeah. If you can play, I don't know, ten, ten hundred meter tempo runs that might take you. You, you might you set the clock for 20 seconds for for the run and, and f let's say 40 seconds for recovery you know each each rep there you can coach somebody you can say right i want you to keep your head up a bit more i want you to think a, a little bit more about bring pushing pushing through the floor or um you know the arm drive or wh whatever the, the coaching point that's relevant for that person tempo runs are great for that and, and that really is what work capacity for me defines it it's you can define it by to, a, to an extent by what it's not mm. it's not it's not high intensity training it's not conditioning it's not metabolic work it's actually a, a level below that generally yeah. that is general preparedness general fitness and and so you should be able to coach people and they should be able to to respond to those coaching cues you can't respond to a coaching cue when you're doing like Tabata burpees yeah. and the fourth minute out of five or whatever, you can't. Yeah, but yeah. work capacity, you can. And so those, I always say those, those three words, everything you, should, everything you ever do should be done with quality, purpose and intent. Mm. So if, you're, if, you, if you don't get the quality, then something's wrong. You yeah. gotta, you take the intensity down the purpose can still be there and the intent can still be there. They're trying the best and they know why. But if they're not doing it with quality, it's too, either the, the, the volume's too high or the intensity's too great. So take it down and that's not work capacity then. You're not raising that in the right way. It's, it's not strength training as such. It's not conditioning. You know, we, we talked offline, you can do mobility work to be in, in, a, in a work capacity way and, mobility circuits like 10 in 10s are great mm -hmm. you know 45 seconds of one mobility movement 15 seconds off times 10 you know 10 different movements or five movements done twice that's really really good to to think about you're not racing through that you're doing purposeful movement in a quality way where you can be coached and raising your work capacity mm -hmm. in a in a really smart way you know that that's really time efficient and then you think about that level of work for an hour most people cannot do that they can't get anywhere close to that yeah and that's really what for me what we're trying to do we're trying to get bang for your book and and allow people to get the best adaptation possible in in the most relevant way for their for themselves and the activities that way yeah, and I think I think the the, the always one the, the difficult one, which is always an art and a science kind of thing. Luckily, the science is starting to catch up a bit. Is is making sure that it's not detrimental to the actual technical session as well. I mean, you've seen you've probably seen it many a time when lads have been beasted or they've done a circuit before they've went into sparring or went into pad drills and stuff, and you're like you've just you've you've took it too far because yeah. now you can't even hold your hands up. Like you're just getting battered all over. What's what's that actually teaching you? And that was something I always struggled with, with especially kettlebell sport, because it's very fatiguing. It, but because it's a sub, such a sub maximal load, but it's actually what's the goal here? If you're trying to run really fast outside of your kettlebell sessions, but where that leaves you fatigued for your your kettlebell sessions, then is it getting you better at your end goal? 
And I think that's where the art and science is. And I think MMA athletes and combat athletes are notorious for that, aren't they? Because they think they should leave every session on a stretcher kind of thing. Do you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good point. Yeah, the, the timing of that, where to place work capacity, where to place this type of stuff is, is really, it is an art. And, and it's timing within that one session. And it's also timing over a, a block of training and, and when is the right time. And so, yeah, if you do that type of work early on in the session, you, you might well see a technical drop off, especially if you're looking at a skill like, say, fighting or, um, or swinging the kettlebells. But, um, but then you, you do have to prioritize it and say, well, what, what is the priority here? What is key? Yeah. How can we how can we really grow as a, and develop as an athlete mm. if we don't prioritize this at some point? And this is where it never gets done well because people never make it a priority because they're always, they're always thinking short term. I want to yeah. get strong now. Yeah, yeah. Actually, if you put the time into that, you get more strength over a longer period yeah. and you get less injuries and all that cool stuff. Um, with MMA and, and those types of sports, that is difficult because, again, there's a lot of volume in that sport. And so the problem was, and it still is a problem, but more so historically, is that you get the fight and, and then it's like, right, all guns blazing for six weeks. I'm going to go absolutely nuts for six to eight weeks and, and get in that cage. And the psychology is I've done more rounds than my opponent. Yeah. But the place that you entered that six to eight weeks was really not at the level where you can now train mm. at that intensity for six to eight weeks. Right, okay, yeah. So the reality is your work capacity, your general level of preparedness is not high enough all year round. Mm. And, and so it's too little too late. Yeah. And it, it's an unprofessional way of looking at your training. What's happened, and, and it has improved, but it still is an issue, is that, but people are training all year round in a, in a, in a smart, slightly smarter way, but um, it still needs to improve. And that's what I'm trying to do with the guys I work with now is to say, these are the milestones that you need to have in the locker when you get that, that fight eight weeks out. You need to be at this place. You need to run. And it's real simple. It's running a 5K um, ideally in sub 20 minutes, but certainly sub 22, depending on your weight. It's having a, a basic level of strength in squats and deadlifts, presses and pulls, and, um, and, and just keeping those milestones really, really simple. And then you know that when we get into the serious stuff, now we've got eight weeks to go, we're in a place where we can give you that volume, we can push you in that way. Otherwise, you just get broken. Yeah, you don't make it to the camp, and, and you end up performing poorly, or not as well as you could do, and that's not what anyone wants, is it? No, no. I think it's it's also it's like you're just living a life of plateaus as well, because you're kind of that if you're not at that level where that six weeks you overreach, and then when you deload, you feel oh, I feel great, I feel great, but actually in a fight or even a competition, I'm speaking from experience because I've had more than more than that, being able to really push it in the gym. But when I've tapered for a comp, I've never been able to replicate that on the platform. And looking at it now and, and in the past, it's actually, well, actually, when I was smashing it in the gym, I was actually overreaching and I was overachieving. When I've tapered, I wasn't able to sustain that for long periods of time. So it's actually increase the work capacity so then when i overreach and i taper off my ability is still able to hit that all of the time do you know what i mean and i yeah. think that you look at some of the best british fighters who've been able to last and stuff and who are sort of professionals all year round and and, and that's what's always made the difference isn't it do you know being able to sustain that for the long term and there's been anomalies in there but generally speaking staying injury free and and being able to think of long-term success, it's it's massively important, that work capacity sort of stuff as well, do you know? So, no, it's, yeah. it's really cool, mate. And I mean, one last thing I want to try and pick your brains on, mate, because I know you're a busy man and stuff, but was kind of, you've got the work capacity, 
And in kettlebell sport, it's kind of strength endurance, power endurance. It's quite a, it's a bit of an equilibrium there because the power comes from that stretch shortening cycle on, on, on jerk. It's static, starting strength, static strength, all of that kind of stuff. But that power endurance, it's always been really cool to watch your modalities on that because you've been really creative and thinking, well, okay, the studies show that I do it on bench press, but my fighters aren't getting in the cage to do a bench press off and stuff like that, you know? So, like, power endurance, again, just for the, for the guys watching the video or listening to it on the podcast, how do they, how do you approach it in terms of that, right, okay, they've got the work capacity, we really need to be able to make sure that my athlete can explode, but not just once, for multiple times over a set period kind of thing. What's, what's your sort of process for that? You know, I know it's a bit of a complex question. Yeah, yeah. So, so for me, power endurance comes when you've built strength, when you've built power, mm. and to an extent, there is a baseline of endurance yeah. as well. So, if you do power endurance without those other two qualities, and you're not fit, then really you're not doing power endurance. You yeah, might yeah. think you are, but there's nothing there. There's no base to build from. So. If you think about, say, five by five power cleans, mm -hmm. and um, you use that, let, let's say, let's say you work through a real basic phase training program where you're doing, let's stick on the theme of th five by fives. If you do five by five for strength, then you're doing say eighty five percent squats, deadlifts, overhead press, bench, or dumbbells and rows and stuff like that. You're going to get strong. Yeah. We know, we know five by five works. Then you introduce more power work now. So suddenly you're doing, you work towards say five by five cleans on one day, five by five snatches on another. Um, you've, you've done some box jumps and plyos and stuff like that prior to that. And you're doing, you've still got some strength in there. If you take five by five cleans and your, your recovery for those cleans is say three minutes between the sets, and that will get you a good level of, of power off yeah. the back of that. It's a good way to develop it. You suddenly change and tweak the rest interval, and you're now doing five-by-five five cleans with a 90-second rest or a 60-second rest. Yeah. That, that is now power endurance. Yeah. Because you're, the point you're, you've come from is, 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 is more, it's more, much more challenging to endure that power than it was before so real simply that that's that's a, a simple progression you've got to get the power and the strength before you get the power endurance then for me then there's two ways to look at power endurance from a in a general way yeah the first way is power endurance with a capital p small e so you look at power work like a heavier loaded power Right. So that would be, uh, for example, the five by five cleans, or you've probably seen the tri sets that I do, where I do a heavy, medium, light. So I do yeah. like four cleans, four snatches, four box jumps. That's a that's a combination of it. But the capital P small e is doing heavier loaded power, and less on the endurance side of it. So still fairly low to medium reps, but but in that way, and yeah. then. Small P capital E is when you're doing things like your kettlebell work. If I was doing, say, I don't know, sets of sets of 12, 30K set kettlebell swings on a 45 or 60 second turnaround mm. for eight to 10 sets, you know, that would be 10 minutes of like small P capital E mm. uh, power endurance work. So if you think of power endurance as a general quality, that's the way I would program it. And, and then you, the third one is, I actually did touch it before, but it's your heavy, medium, light. So you, you do the power endurance curve. Yeah. So it would be your clean snatch box jump or heavy sled push, um, jump squat, mm. sprint, something like that. So you can do power endurance work in, in that way and do time sets yeah, in that yeah. way. But really then, power endurance, at that point of your development, especially for like an MMA fighter, 
within the time the time frame of a training camp, it it actually can can become a specific quality. So it's not you're not really necessarily doing general power endurance. General power endurance is good fun. It's really good fun yeah. because you do cool stuff and you get feedback. It's timed. You can do it either on the stopwatch or like with a push band or something like that yeah. or compete with your friends. And it does have a, it does have a place. But um, for me, it, it, it often when you're w- working with an athlete and a fighter specifically, is it becomes a specific quality of how are we getting you specifically ready to win this fight mm. and not lose this fight? Yeah. So do you need to do some specific foot, footwork drills that happen to, to, to encroach on power endurance because you're having to do it for five minutes? So do we need to invent some specific plyos and movement drills for you? Mm. Is it that we now need to be able to go from an isometric into a power movement and then in, in, into a, a bracing movement again? You know, that, that's a specific power stroke strength endurance modality or drill that we've invented to try and improve you for your contest yeah so you know that that is then limited only by your own creativity and and also what you're you're seeing in your own athlete and what you're seeing in the opponent and that is really cool like we've done a lot of the things i've done and say we know the athlete my guy wants to take him down and he's and the other guy's very good at resisting the takedown so for example we do um sprawl and hit the tackle bag six times explosively with a 20 second recovery or 30 second recovery then go again yeah so it's like a, a specific power endurance modality there where we've yeah. got to get the power on that it might be that we're doing it's the other way around you you know your opponent's going to be taking you down and you want to stay on your feet, so we're doing hurdle hops, lateral hurdle hops for 15 seconds, supersetted with resisted sprawls yeah. for 15 seconds to try and prevent that. And the thing is, if you did that stuff without anything else underneath it, mm. it just becomes fluffy. It just there's no, you know, the quality, purpose, intent. You're losing the quality. You're not getting the intent through the repetitions there. So you've got to have the strength first, the power second, the yeah. endurance, and then you get to either generic power endurance, stroke strength endurance, or you get to that game plan specific preparation. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's, I think I probably rambled a bit there, but no, that's, no, it, that's how it, typically I go about it. I, th- I think sometimes it's, um, I think it just, just highlights how individual and how many variables it is. And I think it's just, it goes back first and foremost, just make sure you've got the fundamentals in place and just you're constantly building those up. And I think power endurance and specific endurance, um, because it's such a, a, a an important piece of the puzzle, but because it's so quite high up, it's, it becomes ultra specific. It's very difficult, like from what I could tell there and from what my experience as well, it's very difficult to make it so general because it's very individual, it's very specific. There's so many different variables in place and stuff. Um, and I think it's always finding that tipping point of actually when if they sort of hit the ceiling on that work capacity or the way I was thinking of, but actually, like we've said, you can always improve that work capacity. You keep on proving up. If your baseline squat is a body weight squat and you keep on hitting that, then you just make that 1.2 times body weight squat and then that becomes your new threshold yeah, the bar raises yeah yeah, totally. yeah ex- exactly so i think no, no, it's, it's really important but i think it, again it just it really highlights the sometimes the bells and whistles stuff of of sort yeah. of the, the 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 ufc highlight reels or um yeah. the youtube clips of 30 seconds of of all these great athletes training because all of the work capacity stuff can sometimes seem quite dull and boring and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. You know, like tempo yeah. and stuff. So yeah, that, that you see, you see a lot of the stuff that happens three weeks out before a contest, and and that is where you are thinking a lot more about 
the actual fight itself, how you're going to, what is your game plan, how you're going to move in that way. And you should, it should be specific at that point. But the re, the bang for your buck is, has already been done. Yeah. That work's already been banked. Yeah. You don't see, nobody wants to watch 17 minutes on a treadmill, <laughs> uh, 105% MAS or whatever yeah. it is. They want to see, you know, the sprawls with resistance bands into pad work. Yeah, yeah. And it is good quality work. It, it, well, cer- it, in certain cases anyway, you know, that you do, you just have to be careful that you don't end up just copying the sport. And it's actually, you have actually analysed the deficiencies and the ways that the physical programme can actually make a difference. Mm. And you've got the eye to break that down and say, this is the area that this person is breaking down here. Yeah, yeah. We now need, it might well be a, a slight deficiency in one part of the chain that we're going to replicate through, I don't know, a resisted glute bridge on a box or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you've done that for a reason. It's, it's, you've, you've watched that, and that, that, may, that means that that work is then more likely to be complementary to mm. the technical sparring that you do. And you're not just saying, right, let's just put a band around him and do that. It's yeah. like, what area is that going wrong? For example, if you, if you were doing it with a power lifter or a strength athlete, at that point you'd look at, What's the bar path then? How is the bar work going mm. on the eccentric, isometric, and concentric? He's slow off his chest, so we need to do some presses off the pins. Yeah. And you're looking at the movement and saying, this is where my athlete is failing. Yeah. And it's no different in a technical sport like MMA where you look at it and you say, in this particular part of his game, we need to invent an exercise that may never have been done before that has an ability to strengthen or improve that technical process. Yeah. But yeah. it's a small part of the training program. Yeah. And if you're doing that 52 weeks of the year, it's like, well, where's your actual training happening here? So that's the concern is that we spend a lot of time talking about that stuff, but actually it's like, just get people fundamentally strong yeah. and fit and raise their work capacity over over time. And so they can dip into this stuff in a more efficient basis. Yeah, they... absolutely. I think that, that word efficiency is, 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 is the epitome of kettlebell sport. But also I think, um, obviously we use heart rate a lot with my guys in the gym and stuff. And I always get that feedback from them because um, sometimes it's kind of, you can hit the certain key positions, but as soon as you start to see that heart rate spike, and they're only 30 seconds into a three, four, five, however long set, it's kind of like, that's only going to start going down. You know, your body can only sustain that for so long, you know? So I think, like you say, the efficiency, but by doing that work, capacity work, the tempo stuff, being able to learn to control the breathing, your heart rate, and actually, it, it's, it's a massive in piece of the puzzle especially in any endurance sport in, in any sport being able to have that dynamic energy control is is massive do you know what i mean like fighters recovering kettlebell lifters being able to try and stay at that that load until they get to seven minutes and then try and push on for the last bit or whatever it may be but yeah it's it's all cool mate there's loads of loads of different variables but i think it goes back to one thing you've always instilled in me is just stay just get better at the basics and nine times out of ten that'll that'll cover all the basics for you do you know so keep uh, working on technique keep keep doing it keep showing up keep being consistent and um you know that that's the key don't don't ever sacrifice technique and and then you, you work capacity technically will improve and and spe- and then there's specific areas that you can focus on and if you if you if you come across people that are unfit raise that up and 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 folk make it a priority I've, I've got no problem putting that stuff right at the, the start right at the front of the session mm. if it, it's just like what's the point in doing the rest yeah you know let, let's get this right let's really build that and uh you, you know it happens quickly yeah that's the good thing about that type of stuff it, in a matter of certainly five to ten sessions you're markedly further on yeah, 
than you were when you started and and then it, the phased approach and bringing the the intensity in can can happen more efficiently then yeah no but no that's like absolutely awesome and I'll, i'm sure the guys um who'll be listening and, and watching have, have took a lot from it you know i think especially just looking at the intricate details but sometimes trying to go too fancy too early on you know it's just important just to listen to that but it's also good to hear it from somebody who's worked with some weird and wonderful sports and <laughs> continues to do so i know you've got a few yeah. guys who are buying for ufc and um and obviously sort of making that big leap up from the smaller promotions into the bigger ones you know which yeah. then is even more important doesn't it you know definitely yeah good stuff right. No, that's, that's awesome, mate, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get you back, and I'm sure the guys will have more questions, but uh, thanks again, mate, I'll, uh, and we'll, we'll catch up soon. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me.